Welcome to the New Books Network. Hello, and welcome to the New Books Network. My name is Elizaveta Reichlina, and I'm a host of the New Books in Russian and Eurasian Studies channel. Today, we're with Dr. Dara Goldstein, Professor Emerita of Russian at Williams College, to discuss her fascinating new culinary history, The Kingdom of Rye, A Brief History of Russian Food, which is out this year from University of California Press. Dara is well known among academics, food writers, and food lovers for her award-winning scholarship and extraordinary cookbooks, such as her 1983 classic, A la Russe, a cookbook of Russian hospitality, which is still in print after more than 30 years, now under the title, A Taste of Russia. Her other marvelous cookbooks include The Georgian Feast, The Vibrant Culture and Savory Food of the Republic of Georgia, winner of the Julia Child Award, uh, and Fire and Ice Classic Nordic Cooking, nominated for a James Beard and the Art of Eating Awards. And most recently, Beyond the North Wind, Russia in Recipes and Lore, which Dara talked about in an earlier New Books Network episode. She's the founding editor of Gastronomica, a journal of food and culture. She's also series editor of California Studies in Food and Culture, and has published widely on literature, the arts, and culinary history. I'm delighted to be speaking with her today. Dara, welcome. Glad to have you on the NBN podcast. Thank you so much. I'm looking forward to talking. I'm delighted to have you with us today. I'm a big fan of your work, both because I've used your cookbooks extensively and in my own cooking, and because I'm a historian of modern Russia, and I'm fascinated by what food can tell us about the different facets of history, the cultural, the economic, and indeed the political. Before we dive into your book, I was wondering if we could start our discussion by having you tell our listeners what inspired you to do this project, which is not a cookbook, but rather a brief history of Russian food that you describe quite poetically in the introduction as, quote, a domestic history that originates from the wooden spoon rather than from the scepter. It was a long time in the making. When people ask me how long it took to write this book, I say, "Mm, about 50 years. So I definitely wasn't actively working on it that long. But when I entered graduate school at Stanford in 1974, which is really dating myself, I wanted to write my dissertation on food in Russian literature uh, because I had started reading Russian literature in college and I was just blown away by how food was used to characterize different characters in the books, um, just the lavish descriptions of meals that allowed you to enter into people's everyday lives or uh, aristocratic lives. And the way it was so erotic in many places, it was as though all of the sex that couldn't be written about was sublimated through the food. And I'm thinking particularly of Chekhov's writing. But I was basically told that food wasn't a serious topic for intellectual inquiry. And that was pretty distressing. But um, I decided to remain in graduate school because I, I wanted to do so. And I wrote my dissertation on a poet named Nikolai Zabolotsky, an amazing Russian poet. And I'm not sorry I did because I was able to immerse myself in the world of of poetry and the visual arts, and it was a a beautiful education. But at the same time, I couldn't stop thinking about the food. And um, in 1978, 79, I went to the Soviet Union as an exhibition guide for uh, the United States Information Agency to represent the U.S., on a traveling exhibition called Agriculture USA. So it was about food production and food distribution in the United States. I mean, it was propaganda, what can I say? (laughs) But it was still, I um, was thinking about both cultures in terms of food. And of course, in those years, those uh, Soviet years, there was a real dearth of food. Um, 
uh, but people managed to create extraordinary meals for me with very little. So I became quite interested in the uh, social aspects of food acquisition. And uh, it was also a very difficult time, and I almost gave up Russian studies. But I decided that the way I could save it for myself was to write about uh, hospitality and how generous the Russians were with so uh, few resources. And that became my first cookbook that you mentioned that I published in 1983. And then I published other cookbooks. I started teaching at Williams and I was teaching literature, but I really wanted to um, keep investigating food. And I published an article around uh, 1999, I think. I can't quite remember the date, but it was on, I had discovered that the great French chef Carême, who lived in the early 19th century, he was one of the first celebrity chefs, had been invited to Russia by Tsar Alexander I after the Napoleonic Wars. And all the histories said he had gone there and cooked for the Tsar. And I thought, I have to research that. And what I found was that he hadn't actually stayed in Russia. He'd gone to Russia, taken the ship from Paris or the Havre, and uh, the czar was not at the dock to meet him. And he was very offended. After all, he was the great chef. And where was the czar? And he decided he was not going to stay. Uh, but he had two weeks till the next boat went back. So he wandered the markets and was pretty disdainful of what he saw. But interestingly, he made a whole series of drawings for monuments for St. Petersburg. And he was quite horrified that a city that was the capital of a grand empire had very low buildings. Of course, he didn't stop to think that it was built on a swamp and the land was not very stable. So there was a really, uh, there was a reason that there weren't enormously tall buildings. But he made a portfolio of drawings, which I then compared to his pièce montée which were uh, dessert creations that he made out of pastry um, or out of, uh, you know, marzipan or different things like that. But he often made them in the form of classical structures and monuments. And it turns out that that portfolio was, um, you know, an hour and a half away at Amherst College. They had a copy of it. So I wrote this article on um, Russia, Karem, and the culinary arts, and it combined all my interests. It was published in the Slavonic and East European Review out of the University of London, and I think, you know, five people read it. And so that was an indication to me that I really needed to write something broader, that could reach more people. But that's when I started editing Gastronomica, the journal, and it really took up all of my time. And I couldn't, uh, I, to be quite honest, signed a, a contract with the University of California Press in 1999 to write my magnum opus on a history of Russian food. And uh, <laughs> it's the first time in my life that I, um, you know, have not met a deadline. So four years ago, five years ago, I can't quite remember, a new director came to University of California Press and I met him and I mentioned I was mortified that I had this contract and I <laughs> had never written the book, but in those 20 years or 20 odd years, my way of approaching food had also changed and I really didn't want to write that same academic book that was 300 pages long and every single statement I made footnote footnoted I could do that but that was going to take away its broad appeal and kind of the pleasure for me because it would be about the academic anxiety of getting it all right and so he said then write a short book just write a short book and so I did so that's a very long-winded answer, but that's how it came about. That's fascinating. Um, your book balances scholarly rigor 
and clear writing in a remarkable way. So uh, it's it's clear that you were aiming for um, a more accessible history uh, of Russian cuisine. Who would you say is your intended audience with this book? Um, I really would like everyone to read it. I feel, I, I mean, that is a non-answer, I guess. But people with curiosity, I think it's um, been a very complicated time, needless to say, to publish the book. And um, it's been a very hard time to talk in any way positively about Russian culture, given the atrocities in Ukraine. And I'm extremely aware of that, and it's all very painful. But at the same time, I feel like it's important to open people's minds to what is good and also what's terrible about the culture. I talk about a lot of dark things in the book as well. It's not simply a celebration of, oh, Russian food is delicious and this is how they feast. There's a lot about hunger. There's a lot about famine. There's a lot about um, bad political and harsh, very cruel uh, political decisions that um, cause people not to thrive. So I think it's important for anyone with a curiosity about uh, Russia and the world to read it. Indeed, when I was reading it, of course, uh, you know, being a historian, I am perfectly aware of the context, but I think anyone who reads uh, your book will come away with an appreciation for just the extent of um, the the difficulties um, in which Russian cuisine has evolved historically, right? Despite, uh, in the face, in fact, of famine and war and uh, state violence and so on. So I think uh, we can uh, delve into the book right now. We open the book and are greeted by two epigraphs. One is a Russian folk saying, which goes, if the rye ripens, it's a good year. The other is a quote from Alexander Pushkin's work of travel literature, A Journey to Arzrum, where he writes, quote, what I wouldn't give for a piece of black bread. What is the significance of this what is known in Russian as black bread or sourdough rye bread to the history of Russian cuisine. And why did you choose your book title as Kingdom of Rye? So I was trying to think of something that would be emblematic of Russia. And given that it is necessarily a short book, I felt as though it had to be something that was vivid. And, um, It seemed to me that rye encapsulated that for a number of reasons. Uh, The primary one being that it is made, the traditional loaf is made by um, lactic fermentation. So you make a sourdough and that enables the dough to rise and it gives it this wonderfully sour taste. We know now that anything that undergoes fermentation is very good for the microbiome in the gut. And I had been struck, um, I taught a course for many years on Russian culture and cuisine. And one of the texts we used was um, Alexander Engelgart's Letters from the Country. Um, He was the rector of St. Petersburg Technical University, I think, and was exiled to his estate in Smolensk um, because there were protests at the university. But he was observing peasant life and they were working really hard in the fields. But he said that really all they wanted, if they didn't have that piece of bread, then they didn't have a meal. And without that sour flavor, whether it came from the rye or whether it came from kvass, which is a very ancient Russian drink 
that is um, also fermented. It is made from rye. You can either take the um, mash that you have used from leftover bread, because of course nothing would go to waste. The bread becomes stale and then you moisten it and allow it to ferment. You add a little bit of honey and let it ferment a little bit longer. And within a couple of days, you have this slightly effervescent, nutty drink that Russians adore. So they wanted their bread, they wanted their kvass, they wanted the sour. And then I was thinking of my own experience um, going to the Soviet Union and then actually Russia itself over the years and seeing how it moved from um, this beautiful, very filling and nutritious loaf of rye bread that could always be had, even when there wasn't other food in the stores. I personally didn't experience a lack of um, rye bread. And then after the collapse of the Soviet Union, everyone wanted baguettes, everyone wanted white bread, the imports, you know, I I mean, the trajectory in the United States was the same and wanted to move immediately from the dark bread, which reminded people of poverty in the old country. And they wanted these light white loaves that in the 50s became wonder bread, you know, that had no texture. I mean, it's a normal progression, I would societal, cultural progression, but it's not a good one. Um, Luckily, we're going back to whole grains now. But it, it seemed to emblematize what was essentially Russian and what was in danger of being lost with all the foreign influence in uh, foods that were being brought in. And I came across a quote, and now I can't remember exactly where it is. I'd have to go through my notes, which is a problem with not having footnotes in the book. I can't find it immediately. But some journalist in the late 19th century referred to Russia as a kingdom of rye because uh, he went out and he saw these fields just so lush with the rye ripening, and it was so beautiful. And um, rye was very well suited to Russia because the climate is harsh until there were modern hybrids of wheat. Uh, Wheat could not successfully be grown in most of Russia, which is again why Ukraine was so coveted by Russia because wheat could grow there and it became the breadbasket for, you know, Russia and then the Soviet empire. And, you know, we know where that has led. So it um, seemed to represent stability and Russianness and also a particular Russian taste. A particular taste and a kind of, um, uh, emblematic uh, symbol, right, of how people have traditionally used food, right? It's not just the bread, but as you said, right, the class, all of the ways of uh, reusing what is leftover or stale bread, uh, and all these sort of uh, ingenious uh, and creative methods that people used in times of hardship, right, not to ever let anything go to waste. I'd like to take a moment to comment on the structure of the book. We open the book to a two-page map of Eurasia, demonstrating just how crucial geography is to the history and development of Russian food. You just mentioned, right, that rye is very well suited to the very harsh climate of Russia, something that historically wheat has not been, right, not until modern variants. The text is then divided into three chapters that are not so much chronological as thematic. And each chapter has a choice literary epigraph. The first from Lev Tolstoy, uh, the second from Lydia Ginsburg, and a third from Anton Chekhov. There's also an epilogue about post-Soviet Russia with a very fitting epigraph from Vladimir Sorokin. And fascinating prints and photographs sprinkled throughout the book. Could you walk our listeners through your process for structuring 
and writing the book in this way? I didn't want to do a straight history starting at, I mean, what date would I choose? I guess 988 when Russia accepted Christianity and it started to become a unified state. So I think um, maybe traditional surveys, uh, historical surveys are done chronologically, but to me that was stultifying because um, it, it didn't, I'm really not good with dates. Like one thing I hate about English is how when you say 17th century, it's actually the 1600s, you know. I just, um, it's not what sparks my imagination. So I wanted to find uh, prevailing themes that I saw throughout Russian history over a 2000 year period that I could use to um, weave a narrative that would feel interconnected without uh, feeling as though it was stuck at a certain moment in time. I wanted to find universalities, I think is what I was looking for. But I felt that, um, and I think this is where my scholarship differs from that of other people who write about uh, academics who write about food. They um, take a topic and they do, you know, extraordinary historical analyses, but they're not people necessarily who spend time in the kitchen. And I feel that a lot of the writing about uh, Russian food or any food for that matter, tells, uh, conveys important information, but no one really gets what the taste is. No one understands the processes of making the food. And to me, um, that is such an important facet of what Russian, not just food, but also culture is. And so it was the great Russian peach, the Russian masonry stove that became the symbol of so much that was how Russian cuisine developed and how Russian life kind of evolved to have the stove at the center of life and everything that it generated. And we can talk about that in more depth if you want. So the stove became very important to the first chapter in terms of process. But then I really wanted to talk about flavors and the land. Because another thing about Russians, I mean, you can say, oh, everyone loves nature. And it's true. You know, well, there are some people who hate nature. <laughs> but for the most part, but I think for Russia. Russians, if you compare foraging activities, you know, it's so trendy in the United States, you get a guide and you go to the park and you forage and you feel you've had a wonderful morning and you feel good about yourself because you're doing something sustainable. But there's this really profound connection between Russians and nature that um, when you go out to gather mushrooms, it is not just, uh, it's really in the hunt. It's a Nabokov in Speak Memory has this extraordinary passage about his mother going out on the hunt. And it's that um, dank, dark, boletic reek that the Russians love is I think how he describes it. Dank, dark, boletic, and yet those words are, gorgeous and evocative. So I want to talk about the Russian relationship to nature. I wanted to talk about the land and also what the land produces. If you think, and in this way, this book follows on Beyond the North Wind, my latest cookbook that looks at the uh, sort of or Russian cuisine of the Arctic, where everyone thinks, well, nothing can grow there. And in fact, it is a very productive, limited, yes, but it is a very productive ecosystem where you can have fish and all kinds of berries and herbs and things like that. So I, I want to show how a harsh climate and also... Um, well, let's stick with the harsh climate for that first chapter, um, and the Russian stove 
came together to create a beautiful cuisine and what the um, characteristics of that cuisine are, the taste and, you know, the aesthetics. But then, of course, that immediately brought me to hunger because there were years when there wasn't enough food. And that brought me to the harshness, not just of the climate, but of the various regimes the Russians have lived under and how uh, climatic conditions have been exacerbated by, you know, really cruel um, policies, including the forced collectivization under Stalin um, in the early 1930s that, that killed millions and millions of Ukrainians. But there were also famines that shouldn't have happened. Um, but the Russians, you know, under the czar wanted to continue exporting wheat because they wanted the revenue for their treasury rather than giving food to the people. I mean, many, many examples. So then the second chapter needed to be about hardship and how the Russians overcame that or strove to overcome it. But then I didn't want to, I actually started the book with that. And my (laughs) editor said, um, can we start with something a little more positive? And I think she was right. So that became the second chapter. And then I want to end with something more celebratory. And what is more celebratory than, than Russians gathered around a table feasting? So that's how it happened. Indeed. I'm glad your editor made the intervention <laughs> because the first chapter, uh, which is titled The Land and Its Flavors, discusses the sort of building blocks of what has become Russian cuisine. It discusses the staple foods that form the core of Russian culinary history. And it's brimming with fascinating details, such as what the etymology of uh, foods, right? The names tells us about how they were prepared or where they uh, came from along the Eurasian trade routes. You also write about the quintessential methods of preparation, uh, the core being, of course, the masonry stove that formed the literal heart of uh, homes, right? And how each type of culinary practice from fermenting to baking to boiling, etc., how that tells us so much about the history of the land and the people. Could you tell our listeners about these quintessential foods and their preparations, and why they have been such constants in Russian history? Oh, there are so many. I better just choose a few. (laughs) Um, I think one that I started with, besides the rye and its many uses, is oats. Again, uh, oats are a very hearty crop. Um, We tend to think of them as oatmeal, period, or oatmeal cookies, <laughs> those are also really good, or fodder for horses. But the Russians way back, you know, in the 12th century, I think I found documentation from then, uh, were making oat milk. So it, it's not just the Swedes who discovered it in the 20th century. But um, one of the ways in which Russian cuisine was shaped was because of the Russian Orthodox Church. As I mentioned, Christianity was adopted in 988, and the church worked very hard to get rid of all uh, vestiges of uh, pagan life and superstition and did not succeed fully by any means. But in a a kind of um, strategic move, I would say, they uh, formulated a calendar, an annual calendar that was based on feasts and fasts. So feasting and fasting, or I should probably say fasting and feasting, because nearly 200 days of the year were considered fast days, which is extraordinary when you think about it. But um, it didn't mean you couldn't eat anything, but you weren't supposed to eat meat on those days, not that the peasants actually had much meat anyway. But um, there were various degrees of stringency depending on the fast day, and dairy was often excluded as well. And then there were longer fasts that could last up to six weeks, and those were very stringent 
And so many Russians were de facto uh, eating a vegan diet. And oats uh, fit in very well to that, as do mushrooms and um, all kinds of things like that. So from the oats, they could make this milk, but then they could um, allow the milk to ferment. They put a little bit of rye bread into it to, uh, because the sourdough would help the fermentation. And then uh, they turned it into kisel, which uh, means sour. I mean, it's the root for sour. And it was a pudding. So if you think of like a vanilla pudding, except with an oat base and not the sugar, um, then that uh, gives you a taste of what the early Russians were eating. Kisel could also be made and frequently was made with peas, dried peas as well, because they're a wonderful source of protein. And people either seem to have loved it or hated it. It's a recipe I considered making for the cookbook. But then I thought, you know, most people, I have a limited number of recipes I can include and people are not going to want peace porridge, basically, which sounds like the stuff of Dickens. But uh, one of the things I love is uh, in English, we say in days of yore, when we want to talk about the the past and it kind of evokes Arthurian legends and knights in armor and things like that. In Russian, they say in the days of Tsar P, which um, is a food metaphor. It's a time when people were basically living on gruel. And if you had a little bit of butter, which not everyone had, then it could make it much tastier than, say, using hemp seed oil, which was the more typical lubricant that people used. Or if you added a bit of garlic, it could be good. But there were some regions of Russia that were very famous for their preparation of it. Speaking of oils, the hemp seed oil and uh, actually flaxseed oil are the more traditional oils uh, that are associated with Russian culinary history. Sunflower oil uh, was actually a later addition and also uh, very much connected with Russia's acquisition of the Russian Empire's acquisition of Ukraine. Yes, and it's uh, sunflower is actually native to the Americas. So it didn't get to the old world um, until after the 16th century and didn't really start to be in widespread use until the 18th century. So it's, it's much later. But of course, it's become much more widespread. It's tastier for sure than hemp seed and flaxseed. It's richer indeed. And uh, similarly, potatoes, which are often associated with uh, uh, Soviet, especially uh, food um, and Russian food in general. Uh, but that was also a very late, relatively speaking, uh, adoption into the cuisine. Potatoes are such an interesting case because when I meet people who don't know about Russian food or who had been to Leningrad, you know, to go to the Hermitage uh, during Soviet years, all they thought it was was really tough, grisly meat and potatoes. And it's pretty fascinating. There was a lot of resistance to the potato, which came from the New World um, throughout Europe, but there was more resistance in Russia than elsewhere. Um, Peter the Great, who we know loved all things Dutch, first encountered them probably around 1697 in Rotterdam, and he had some sent back to Count Sheremetyev uh, because he wanted them to plant them, begin to disseminate them. And I don't know what happened to that first shipment, but um, they weren't widely planted. And over um, the course of the 18th century, particularly um, under uh, Catherine the Great, there were actual edicts issued, ukas, uh, saying you must plant potatoes. And the Russian peasants were terrified of the potato 
The potato grew underground. It had eyes. It obviously was in league with the devil. Um, and it all sounds very funny, but when you think about it, it's the same family as the nightshade. And there is poisonous nightshade. And also, if you have ever grown potatoes, you know that if you don't heal them properly, they can get a lot of chlorophyll on the surface, a sort of green cast. And if you eat too many potatoes that have the green on them, you can actually get very sick from a, a chemical called solanine. So there was a scientific basis to their wariness, not that they knew that they just knew that it was the devil's food. And there were actual potato riots as late as the 1840s where people were killed. And it was only after the government decided to stop using force and to use greater persuasion that uh, potatoes began to be planted. And by the second half of the 19th century, they became the mainstay and started to supplant rye, as a matter of fact. And, and then, as you mentioned, during the so Soviet years, it's what allowed people to feel that they were at least marginally self-sufficient when there was no food in the store. They had their uh, little gardens that they could cultivate, and they always grew the potato. It was uh, a lifesaver, literally. The uh, small garden plots that people had and the phenomenon, the sort of cultural phenomenon of the dacha, right, is in fact something that allowed people to survive in periods of great food scarcity. When you had the food under your own control, you could grow, you know, the small bit of potatoes, a little bit of cabbage, carrot, onion, etc. Uh, on your um, plots. And so these dachas are uh, quite crucial to also chapter two, um, how people navigated uh, these uh, prolonged periods of um, uh, war and deprivation during the Soviet period. Um, so chapter two is called Hardship and Hunger, and that explores how people and cuisine survived during these long periods of privation. Indeed, food scarcity has been a constant refrain in Russian history. You talked about the more than 200 days of, um, of uh, in the Orthodox calendar year of fasting, right? And how the traditional Russian cuisine is very heavily vegetarian, in fact. Um, how how did Russian cuisine adapt to periods of privation and how did people find creative ways to both procure food and to combine ingredients and cooking methods to uh, great effect? With the part of the population, and that was the majority of the population <laughs> that was living under duress um, in pre-Soviet times, when there was famine, they would go out and uh, forage for all kinds of wild foods. They made a bread called chaff bread, which, you know, when you winnow grain, you want to separate, well, the song goes, separate the wheat from the chaff, <laughs> but separate the, the rye from the chaff. The chaff is the spiky part of the grain, and it's not the nutritious part. Um, but it gives bulk. So if you have that in the bread, then you have a weightier loaf, even if it's not as nutritious, but it also is like eating pins or needles. It's really unpleasant. They would scrape the um, inner bark of birch trees and take that and boil it uh, to try and get some nutrition from that. And I actually tried making, it's called zabalan, um, that inner bark. And I tried to make a porridge out of it. And it was so bitter that it just um, wasn't appealing. I, I didn't keep it as a traditional Russian recipe. <laughs> you asked about creative ways in which Russians dealt with hunger and hardship. 
And one of the most interesting has to do with the way the typical Russian peasant village was structured. It was very close knit and it was um, what's called a mir. There was a, a community. It means world. It was a world unto itself. And if um, people were hungry, they engaged in a practice called begging for crusts which meant that they, uh, usually women and children, would go from their village, either walking or, you know, with a cart, to a neighboring village or in very bad times, a more distant village, or sometimes to a wealthier house of gentry, perhaps, although they mostly kept among the villages, to ask for any spare bit of bread, Uh, whether it was the dry crusts, of bread that had been dried in the Russian masonry stove, because as I mentioned, nothing ever went to waste. So if bread was starting to get stale, you just let it dry. And then you had something called a rusk, you know, which is like a cracker. So they would go begging for crust and the crust would always be given, even if those people themselves were suffering a relative degree of hardship, if they had anything, because they knew that in the next year, the situation could be reversed. It was all, um, they're very fatalistic. It wasn't, their fate wasn't in their hands. It was God given and who knew what would happen. So that allowed people to survive and to support one another and create a sense of community in the midst of adversity. Adversity. And we have uh, chapter two, uh, you know, going into the depths of the sort of um, the bleaker moments in Russian history. Uh, examples you give examples of the Great Famines. You give examples of uh, the uh, the Civil War that occurred after um, after the revolution. You talk about. Uh, Soviet deficits, uh, sometimes deficits, right, in quotes, um, and how regular people managed to find ways to survive, right, and um, and to procure the food and to combine the ingredients. But then the third chapter takes us on to a different theme, and it has a very different note. It's titled Hospitality and Excess, right? So abundance. Uh, What role did hospitality and hosting play in the development of Russian cuisine over the centuries? Religion has always been a very important part of Russian life, for better or for worse, I might add. And um, at the core of it is this idea that a guest is a gift from God, The guest is to be honored above all. Even in a Russian peasant cottage, a very, you know, poor, squalid place, there um, it was divided. One room was divided, not by walls, but by these sections that were demarcated by where the Russian stove was, which could take up a good quarter of the living space. And then kitty corner to that would be um, the beautiful corner. And the beautiful corner was where the table was, and hanging over that was always an icon with a lamp. So that was, you know, God's grace brought into the peasant cottage. And the guest would always be seated in the beautiful corner under the icon and given um, the best of what the family had, extending in um, pre Petrine times to in wealthy families where women were living in seclusion, the host bringing out his wife to offer the foreign guest, the the very esteemed guest, the best that the host had, naming his namely his wife, who would be forced to offer a goblet of vodka or brandy and then kiss him on his lips which is uh, pretty awful for the woman when you think about it. But there it was. That um, practice luckily died out. But even in times of hardship, there would be small efforts made to uh, turn something into more than just 
uh, the basic thing that it was, for instance, during the siege of Leningrad, when there's virtually no food, people were being given 125 grams of bread a day, which is like a quarter pound, and there was nothing else. If they managed to get a little bit of sugar that they had scraped from the ground where the Badaev sugar factory had burned and there was that tiny bit of sweetness and they put the bread on the skillet toasted it slightly if they had fuel and put that little bit of earth sugar on it then it became something that was beautiful almost like a the finest pastry you could imagine that they could offer to someone so it was um going beyond what would seem like uh, the confines of um, reality to get to another place that may only have been partly symbolic, um, may only have been partly nourishing, but highly symbolic. But one thing we haven't talked about is um, the 5% or uh, whatever the proportion was of the very wealthy who were extraordinarily wealthy. I mean, so much money and so many serfs, hundreds of thousands of serfs to do their bidding. And they had a lot of leisure and they, um, many of them liked to eat and they liked to show off in very performative ways to display their wealth. So a lot of what you find um, among the aristocracy was ways to regale and surprise guests with the most outré dinners that they could imagine. And certainly at the czar's table dinners that would last eight hours with many, many different foods, even on fast days, there is a documented feast um, from, I think it's 17... Uh, 17th century, <laughs> um, where they had 500 different dishes and not one of them was meat. Uh, so that's not really fasting in the spiritual sense, but it's only superficial. But the excess was very much part of how they uh, chose to live their lives, many of them or they would feed their turkeys on truffles and chestnuts and heavy cream. And one wrapped his um, chickens in diapers, I think, and, you know, swaddled them and <laughs> tried to make sure they'd be as tasty as possible. That's quite the image. Uh, and we also have examples of um, the aristocracy running these uh, greenhouses, these hothouses where they would grow exotic uh, fruits or fruits that uh, were quite difficult to procure otherwise, uh, such as pineapple, uh, in order to be able to then display it, right, at these uh, lavish feasts. Pineapple became the thing. And uh, there was a nobleman, I think his name was Zavadovsky, who uh, went bankrupt, basically, because he was um, <laughs> growing and using so many pineapples and they were so expensive. But interestingly, in um, the teens, just before the revolution, pineapples became the symbol in Russian poetry of the decadence of um, the czarist regime. And, and they were used uh, as really um, emblematic of everything that was wrong with society. Quite the opposite from the the image of the uh, piece of rye bread, right? Yes. Um, is this <laughs> this uh, uh, quite a superfluous, right? Uh, extravagant fruit, uh, this uh, pineapple. Mm -hmm. So feasting, though, was not limited to the elites, right? On the feast days, the uh, we would say common folk also had uh, reason to. Uh, celebrate, and they went all out. They did. And uh, they would scrimp and save so that they could celebrate a feast appropriately. And I think that the glory of the Russian feast, particularly in um, average households, would be a grand pie, 
of some sort. And, you know, in um, the States, when we say pie, we tend to go sweet. We think of all kinds of sweet pies, but for Russians, it's much more often savory. And one of the grand celebratory pies, the kurnik, um, is a chicken pie that is domed. Um, it was often said to um, represent the the cap of Monomach, you know, from the 13th century, I think. Maybe I have my centuries wrong, but it was way back when because it had this rounded crown and um, just layers and layers of chicken and rice or buckwheat and um, onions and mushrooms and uh, another favorite pie that uh, actually was adopted into French cuisine is Kulibiaka which became Kulibiak in French. And it's really extraordinary. That one is oval. So instead of being high, it's long, but it also has many layers of sturgeon and salmon. Um, the pie dough is lined with blinchiki, which are like uh, thin crepes so that the dough doesn't get soggy. And then you have the fish and you have layers of buckwheat or sometimes rice. You have lots of dill, onions, um, mushrooms, viziga, which is the dried backbone of the sturgeon, very hard to procure these days, um, but that helps uh, bind it all together. It's very gelatinous once it's heated, and uh, butter and broth, and it's just glorious. And uh, your one of your chapters has Anton Chekhov's description of this uh, pie, which is absolutely incredible, right? He talks about the butter running down the fingers. <laughs> yes. And because Kulibyaka in Russian is gendered as feminine, when he refers to it, it's also she. I mean, it could be she, and he's talking about his fingers running over it and uh, it being a kind of temptress. So that's um, a really wonderful passage. It is indeed. And Chekhov would, uh, he has so much food imagery actually in his, in his works. Um, he's a quite, um, quite remarkable in that sense. But uh, Russian literature is full of references to food. And um, one of uh, the foods you just mentioned, blinli, Right, so these are also a staple of feasting days for the common people. They would make them and sort of sell them, right, and and, and consume them at these uh, fairs and at the fairgrounds during what's called maslinitsa, right? Which, as the co- as the core of that word is uh, masla, or uh, butter or oil, right? Yeah. I, in this case, it's, it's quite definitely symbolic. butter. <laughs> yes. So, yes. Uh, the blini are really wonderful. They're one of the oldest Russian foods. And originally, they were um, baked on hot stones. This is before people even were using stoves. Uh, just at the spring equinox, when the sun was starting to come back after the long, cold winter that was very dark, so end of February into mid-March, and it was in the baked in the image of the sun, so it's conjuring the sun, it's saying, come back, sun, come back, and here we will help you on your journey. And um, when Russian Orthodoxy came to Russia, that uh, celebratory practice was subsumed into the Russian Orthodox Church. So in the West, we have um, Mardi Gras, you know, which is Fat Tuesday, where you eat a lot of rich foods just before Lent. You have Shrove Tuesday in England, where you eat a lot of pancakes just before Lent. When I talk about Russian excess, well, in Russia, they have Masinitsa, which you just mentioned, which is a week-long butter festival. (laughs) So it's not just one day, the Fat Tuesday, it's the entire week. And blini were made throughout the week, and there was a whole almost calendar of who was supposed to prepare the blini on what day, whether it was the new bride, Um, showing off her cooking prowess for her scary mother-in-law 
or the mother-in-law inviting the young new couple to her house. There were fairs, there were lots of these uh, kiosks that were set up to um, make the blini and people ate them, as you might imagine, with lots of butter. They're very porous and there's a marvelous passage in Gogol's Dead Souls about Chichikov. Um, and he is rolling his blimi and then dipping them in butter. And it's just, and he's oozing all kinds of, you know, bad character traits. But after he eats those, it's like he's also oozing butter from every pore. Uh, that is one of the best passages, yes, uh, um, in the butter-related canon. The, um, the, uh, epilogue on post-Soviet Russian food. It traces a journey from, again, deficit in and scarcity in the 1990s amid the arrival of Western goods and foods to what you call a food revolution in that has taken place over the last decade, decade and a half or so. What is what are the characteristics of this fascinating arc, right? Oh, starting in the 1990s, and uh, what is what has been this food revolution in Russian cuisine that you have, in fact, observed firsthand? I would say it started with the arrival of McDonald's in 1990, um, early in 1990. So it was two years before the Soviet Union collapsed. And it was so emblematic that, you know, this um, American, super American corporation would set up not very far from Red Square, the seat of Soviet power. And uh, it was the largest McDonald's in the world, had 900 seats. And on opening day, something like 35,000 people showed up and they had to have policemen with crowd control. Um, and then the Soviet Union collapsed and all of this foreign food uh, started pouring in and people were just thrilled. They had access to things they'd never heard of, never seen. It was very exciting, but then the economy just tanked. I mean, in desperate ways, inflation was something like 2000% um, in like 1992 or 93 um, and people were really suffering. That's when they were relying a lot on the potatoes they were growing. But there was also this sense that, well, what do we have? Because they'd been looking to all these foreign goods. They weren't drinking Stoli, uh, Stalichnaya vodka. They wanted absolute. They wanted everything that was foreign labeled and foreign branded. But they turned uh, to look at themselves and they realized that they had this long tradition of food and hardship and what did people do. Um, classic Russian cookbooks like Yelena Malachovets's A Gift to Young Housewives had been banned during the Soviet years because of her um, talk about all the foods that regular people were eating. Um, that was newly republished. And people began to find ways to celebrate what was Russian. So um, one of the leaders of this new interest in native Russian foods was a man named Boris Akimov, who in 2009 founded um, an enterprise, I guess you would call it, called Lafka Lafka, which means shop or counter. Um, and he was trying to be like a middleman between farmers and consumers. So he was looking at these farmers who were really struggling and still trying to grow crops like buckwheat, you know, which people had forsaken for Western cereal instead of having the buckwheat porridge that their grandmother lovingly prepared for them. They wanted cornflakes or something. Um, so he would find outlets for their crops, and it turned into this wonderful, very enterprising organization that then uh, set up a cafe in Moscow, um, briefly in St. Petersburg as well. And um, 
so people became interested in so-called real Russian food. And then with the invasion of Crimea in 2014, uh, the U.S. and uh, the EU and Australia, Canada, um, placed sanctions on Russia. And the Russians retaliated. It was Putin who retaliated by then placing sanctions on agricultural imports from these places. So suddenly the Russians had to start uh, doing things on their own. And they had become enamored of cheeses of all kinds. Interestingly, in uh, Russian culinary culture, there was no uh, tradition of aged cheeses. Amazing fresh cheeses, you know, farmer's cheese, cottage cheeses, all kinds of dairy products, but no aged cheese. And they learned how to make Russian Parmesan, Brie, Feta, Cheddar, uh, really fantastically because of these constraints. So now I'm not talking so much about hunger, but about desire. So desire also can become a driving force for change in culinary habits. And so they could still get cheeses. But um, it became tinged with nationalism And I think what I personally am struggling with now when I talk about the food revolution there, it's really wonderful in that people um, have uh, become open to a wide world of flavors, let's say, and that chefs are experimenting with old Russian foods and uh, trying to bring them back or to present them in new ways. There, um, Vladimir Muchen, who's at White Rabbit, in Moscow, has sort of styled his program after what Rene Redzepi was doing at Noma in Copenhagen, a kind of new Nordic cuisine, and he feels the new Russian can be as uh, life-changing as the new Nordic, and there are, there are certain similarities. But it, it's tinged with this idea of what is nosh, what is ours. And you know that the... Um, previous uh, youth political organization that was very pro-Putin, you know, it was Nashi. And so there's a way in which food um, is implicated. Well, food is always implicated in politics, but it's implicated now in um, the kind of darker side of politics. And it is less a celebration, perhaps, of what is intrinsically beautifully Russian, than uh, claiming a space and uh, broadcasting it as Russian as opposed to Western, which is uh, somewhat negatively marked in certain circles. And I hope I have said that forcefully, but um, um, in a politic way. So it, it's pretty complicated right now, especially as food is being used as a, a weapon in the war in Ukraine. That actually, I was going to ask you about that. Um, it is incredibly complicated right now, as you say, you know, because we we've had in we've witnessed in Russia this um, flowering of artisanal food cultures and just absolute explosion in the amount of people who are interested in making the food, in growing the food themselves, right, farm to, farm to table. Um, and we have also seen how these domestic Russian foods have been co-opted in a kind of nationalist rhetoric by people saying, see, we don't need the Western imports. We have everything ourselves. There's been, of course, the... Um, much uh, mocked idea of import substitution, uh, but people who have been, uh, you know, the, the uh, arguing in a nationalist vein have pointed to that, unfortunately, to say that here we have everything we need. And so I was going to ask about the last pages of your book, which you call What is to Come? And this was written before uh, the February 24th invasion. We are recording this interview in November 2022 in the midst of Russia's war in Ukraine. We know that historically wars have inflected the development of national cuisines 
Ukraine has experienced a rediscovery of its own culinary heritage, of course. In the Russian case, cuisine has become incredibly politicized. How do you see the domestic Russian food industry and food culture faring now? Oh, I really don't know that I can answer that with any kind of certainty. I think um, people are struggling there and they're struggling to uh, find ways to exist in a a society that um, is now deeply immoral. And so I don't think that food is in the spotlight the way it was even a couple of years ago when there was a lot of excitement about different developments and and things like that. Um, I, yeah, I'm really struggling here. I think that the through line will be this Russian ability to endure no matter what um, hardships come. I mean, obviously, many lives will be damaged or destroyed, but um, this essential taste for what comes from the earth, the earthiness, the, uh, the fermentation, the honey, the um, gifts of the Russian land will always be the anchors for people, um, even in times of hardship. I don't think that they're going to be uh, promoting Russian food um, on the world scene anytime soon. And in fact, Russian restaurants uh, throughout the U.S. um, are really suffering, even though many of the people who opened them themselves were uh, refugees from the Soviet system. So, you know, it's all very complicated. And I don't feel that I have answered your question, but um, at the moment, I'm not really sure what is to come. And I don't see myself going back there anytime soon to find out. In truth, that was a very difficult question that I posed to you. I think uh, no one can really Uh, forecast uh, what is going to uh, happen with uh, the domestic Russian food industry right now. Um, It's, you know, when when people talk about uh, food right now in the Russian context, it's mainly in the case of sanctions and how Western chains and restaurants have left, including that the the closure right of that very symbolic uh, McDonald's location right in Moscow, and for people, uh, for observers of Russia, when when they saw that, that was quite um, uh, sort of indicative of what is going to now be a sort of new Iron Curtain. But before we end. Uh, I would like to ask you about what you are currently working on. Could you tell us, share with our listeners, what projects you're currently uh, taking on um, and also where our listeners can follow you and follow your uh, your work? I decided I needed to uh, move, if only tangentially, from the Russian space. Um When this book was published last May, when The Kingdom of Rye came out, I was invited to give a talk in New York City. And uh, to make it relevant to the moment, I decided to speak about Russia, Ukraine, and food. Because there's a history there, as I mentioned earlier, um, with Stalin's playbook in Ukraine and collectivization, the use of food as a weapon. And I just felt that um, I wanted to not just focus on uh, what I talked about in the book, even though I I do mention 
um, the collectivization, but also bring it into the moment so that it, it seemed relevant. And um, there was a huge outcry against the venue for hosting me, um, someone who's a Russia scholar. And then I was uh, quite badly trolled on Instagram and accused of, of many things. So um, I don't really want to be um, out there proselytizing or seeming to proselytize for Russia at the moment, even as I feel it's so important that people understand it. So I am uh, moving away from a strictly Russian project. I'm working on a series of um, six small books, which are on various aspects of preserving. So it's preserved foods. And this in many ways came directly out of my experience of working with Russian food where fermentation is so important. So it's a lot of fermentation, it's pickling, it's curing, it's dehydrating. Um, and these volumes are uh, condiments and fruits are the first two and they'll launch in another year because it takes, I'm just on deadline now. So I'm just finishing those two up with my um, co-authors. And then there will be grains and uh, beverages, dairy, and vegetables. And they're international, so they range throughout the world. And it's a, a wonderful project because it's also very much a learning curve for me to delve into other cultures that I haven't, um, that I'm not intimate with in the same way that I know Russian culture. I must say that sounds absolutely fascinating, uh, and I can't, I, I can't wait to uh, see those books in print. Very much looking forward to that. Um, and so, uh, where could our listeners actually read up on your uh, projects? Where should they? Uh, what website should they visit? Well, I have my own website, which is Dara Gold, uh, Dara um, but I'm not very active on it, so I don't regularly post things. I think that, um, and I, I'm sort of um, not doing Twitter these days. I can't much. imagine most people are. <laughs> right. So the place to find me or to see what I'm cooking or baking or fermenting is on Instagram. Um I'm not quite as active as I was six months ago, but I'm, you know, coming back. And uh, it's Dara.Goldstein, and you can find me there. Wonderful. We'll be sure to visit you there. Dara, thank you so much for taking the time to speak with me today. Best of luck on all these projects uh, going forward. We can't wait uh, to see them in print. And thank you so much, Lisa, for your interest in this book, particularly at this very fraught time. And uh, you had a lot of great questions, so I appreciate it. This was, uh, it was absolutely wonderful to, to speak with you. Uh, and to our listeners, thank you for listening to this episode and be sure to check out The Kingdom of Rye, A Brief History of Russian Food, wherever excellent books are sold. This has been New Books in Russian and Eurasian Studies, a podcast channel on the New Books Network. Until next time.